Okay, so what about Tibetan specifically? When we started, we said we wanted to discuss Tibetan as a second language. So we started with the big picture. What is language in general and how do we learn one? And now we kind of want to know, well, what about Tibetan specifically? In what ways is it just another language to learn? And in what ways is it unique? And how do we take that into consideration when we're developing an effective way to teach it and an effective way to learn it? So the first point I want to make here is Tibetan is not a dead classical language. So um, we kind of think of oh, Sanskrit and we think Latin and we think ancient Greek. These are the kind of languages we come to, that come to mind when we think of a classical language. And so when we call uh, written Tibetan, literary Tibetan, when we call it classical Tibetan, then this is kind of the uh, associations that we have built up in our own language. Um, but it's not really uh, that situation. It's a different situation. And it's what I like to call, it's a living diglossia. So when we look at the timeline of Tibetan, for example, uh, when we're talking about classical languages, these are antiquity, they're ancient. Um, but when we're talking about Tibetan, it's a medieval language, right? Tunme Samboto was 650, uh, 700, somewhere in that area. So it's a lot closer to Arabic or Japanese when we're thinking of classical languages. And that's a really big difference, 1500 years. Tibetan is a deglacia. And what do I mean when I say that? So all languages have this spectrum between high language, H, and low language. So when we're talking about high, we're talking about formal, learned, literary language, prestigious, official. It's a form of the language that usually you need education to learn. When we're talking about the low, we're talking about natural, informal, the spoken, the common, and the everyday. So in every language, we have this spectrum from low to high. And in Tibetan, we also have this spectrum and the uh, lowest low to the highest high is just a bit uh, broader than it is in English. But we have to realize that English and, you know, the modern European languages and a lot of the other languages now use vernacular and spoken language for reading and writing. Historically, that hasn't been the norm. Historically, the situation that Tibetan language is in was the norm. And when we're looking at languages today that are similar to Tibetan, um, we can't really say classical Sanskrit is very similar, like we saw with the time period. It's just not even close, right? Uh, something that's a lot closer is Arabic. You know, we have a culturally defining literature. This is one qualification for being a Deglossia Tibetan. We have the Tibetan Buddhist canon, and in Arabic, they have the Quran. We have an age of literature that we still use those literary forms for reading and writing for Tibetan, that seventh century and Arabic same. And then we have today, you know, this uh, separation between the high and the low language. And we have that in both languages as well. Um, now, when we're talking about Arabic, uh, it used to be very similar to Tibetan, but they've started moving in a more um, uh, a direction of, with using more communicative techniques. So the field of teaching Arabic as a foreign language has benefited from the advances in foreign language teaching, such as moving away from the grammar and vocabulary focused methods toward a more, con more communicative techniques. Um, one more, the use of Latin, especially in spoken and conversational discourse has experienced a dramatic growth in popularity among teachers and students in the last two decades. So even if we don't believe that, oh, spoken Tibetan is close enough to so-called classical Tibetan to be useful, actually, a lot of programs are now doing spoken immersion for languages like Latin and ancient Greek and Sanskrit. And again, when we think about what language is uh, and how it's speech and social and sense, it makes a lot of sense to move in that direction. So final Ternod quote, anyone who knows colloquial Tibetan can quite easily learn the literary language. So when we're talking about language being mostly spoken and mostly social and mostly sense, I think it really makes 
the most amount of sense and it's going to be the most effective and efficient use of our time to start with the spoken language as a base and then move towards the literary language as Ternod suggests here. And so when we're talking about building a modern pedagogy for Tibetan as a second language, we're talking about realizing that speech and social contexts and sense making are really the foundation of a language. So we're equi equipping students with those tools so that they can use them on their day-to-day -day climb. We're talking about developing a solid teaching materials based in the research of today that are you know creating clear pathways towards literacy and towards um, making that uh, progress a reality and we're talking about providing expert guides uh, in practice-based environments where students feel comfortable making lots of mistakes on their climb and learning from those mistakes and building their skills in reading writing listening and speaking. And we're realizing that all four of those skills kind of come together to build a student's overall ability to use and understand language.